to speak about something that, um, something that has become a norm in our culture, something that's become more than a norm, something that's become uh, something that we strive for in our culture. And I want to say that that something is not godly. It's not godly. And uh, the world is perverting its thinking and perverting and perverting humanity, and it always has. So this isn't some new problem. This is the problem that always was and always will be because this is the realm that the enemy works in, um, and that is in, in materialism, in idolatry, and, and I want you to understand what materialism is, and I want you to understand what idolatry is, and it's not sectioned off into money, or uh, it's not just money, it's not just things that uh, we would commonly associate with, but uh, what, what I want you to do is I want you to turn to Judges, Judges, uh, I have my mallet, I'm a judge, Judges were set up by Moses because his father-in-law gave him a good suggestion, so those of you who are married or are going to be married, Father-in-laws can uh, give you a good suggestion. You keep them close, but you don't let them in the family. You know what I'm saying? Anyway, so look, because it's your own family. Anyway, word of suggestion, word of advice. It's godly, right? The two shall become one flesh. They're separated from other fathers. And that's a different sermon for a different day. Listen, but it got, Moses set up judges in order to judge the people. And as time went on, Moses died. They crossed into the promised land. And then there was this time of judges where Israel did not have a king. And during the time of judges, the Bible says that people lived according to their own, uh, according to their own theologies or according to their own way because there was no judge. And so if you have turned to Judges, look at chapter 17, and we're going to start in verse 1. We're going to start in verse 1. So Judges chapter 17 and verse 1. Here's what it says. Here's what it says. Now a man named Micah, say Micah. Micah, this is not the same Micah that uh, there's a book in the Bible called uh, Micah. He's a small prophet. Um, and it's really cool. So this guy named Micah, excuse me, excuse me. I just want to come through here real quick. So there's this guy in the Bible. His name is Micah. And, uh, and he's here in Judges. And uh, they're writing about Micah. So it's, it's, amazing. it's amazing. Isn't that funny? It's crazy. I know. It's so funny. I love Micah. He's really funny. But anyway, so Micah, Micah's in the Bible, and it says that in verse 1, it says, Now a man named Micah from the hill country of Ephraim said to his mother, The 1,100 shekels of silver that were taken from you and about which I have heard you utter a curse, I have that silver with me. I took it. So Micah is, uh, Micah is, Micah robbed his mom. And so he said 1,100 talents of silver, 100 talents of silver. I did the math on this earlier today. is about $8,000. So he stole about 88 grand from his mom. I know we read this scripture and we're like, so what? 1,100 talents of silver ain't none. He stole like $88,000 from his mom, he cleared her out, right? He probably cleared her out. He's like, ah, you know what? But I heard you cursing the person that stole the silver. And he's like, I'm afraid of that curse, in other words. And so, hey, you know what? I took it. Uh, he doesn't apologize. He doesn't do anything like that. He's like, yeah, I took that silver. And so what does she do? She says, then his mother said, the Lord bless you, my son. Uh, when, when he returns, so instead of like punishing him or anything like that, instead she's like, oh yeah, you're a robber. You're a thief, uh, but may God bless you. She's, in other words, she's like trying to counter the curse uh, because she, she was cursing whoever stole the money, but she didn't know that she was cursing her son. And so when she found out it was her son, she tries to counter the curse with a blessing. And then it goes on to say, when he returned the 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother, she said, I will uh, solemnly consecrate my silver to the Lord for my son to make a carving of image of image and a cast idol, I will give it back to you. Let me read that again. When he returned the 1,100 shekels of silver, his mother said, 
to his mother. She said, I will solemnly consecrate my silver to the Lord for my son to make a carved image and a cast idol. I will give it back to you. So he returned the silver to his mother and she took 200 shekels, $8,000, about 50 pounds of silver. 50 pounds? How much is 50 pounds, Victor? Is it big? How big? Probably about this big. It's probably about this big. We're talking a big block of silver. He took 50 pounds of silver. And uh, it goes on to say that he took 200 shekels of silver and gave them to a silversmith who, who can make them into an image and an idol. And they put, and they put it in Micah's house. Uh, now this man, Micah, had a shrine and he made an ephod and some idols and installed one of his sons as his priest. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. Everyone did as he saw fit. So this is interesting. There's a little bit that we can unpack here, and that is that this guy, Micah, this guy, Micah, robs his mom. And the very thing, so in other words, he sins, and the very thing that he sinned against he, he turned around and justifies and glorifies it. You guys see that? So he sinned by stealing her money. He sinned by stealing her silver. And instead of apologizing and saying, Mom, you know, don't remove your curse. Here's your money back. He's saying, if you'll remove the curse, I'll give you the money back, in other words. And so what he does is she gives the money. She's like, all right, I'm going to dedicate this money to God. But I'm going to give you uh, 50 pounds of silver and you go make an idol. So what's happening is that the very thing that was the sin all of a sudden becomes the worship in his life. All of a sudden it becomes his foundation. And I think that sometimes in our lives, the very thing that pulls us away from God, we turn and justify. We'll turn around and we'll try to justify the very thing that's pulling us away from God. Please understand me right. All of you go to school. I got a college degree. My wife has a college degree. Almost every single leader in here has some sort of college degree or they're in college to get a degree. Go to school. But if school becomes your idol and you start, and you start separating yourself from God because of your idol, now the Bible says do all things as unto the Lord. So if you're going to school, you should be studying, you should be wholehearted. You better get good grades. You better. I hope you do. Don't be lazy, because if the only reason people don't get good grades, it's not because they're dumb, it's because they're lazy. The only reason workers are bad, I was, had an interview today, and, and we were talking with the guy, said, the only reason workers are bad is because they're lazy. It's not because they can't do the work. So yeah, go to school, do your thing, but let me tell you something. Your first commitment must be to God, and don't turn around and say, well, I'm so busy with this that I can't serve God here. Because what's happening is all of a sudden you're saying, hey, because school is so important to me, it's more important than my relationship with God. I am so busy with school, I don't have time to read my Bible. And I say, baloney. Here's why. Here's why I say baloney. I un now listen, this is circumstantial. I understand midterms. God, I know. I understand midterms. I understand finals. I understand that some of you guys got a cram. It's normal. And if you have to miss a day here or there because you got finals or midterms, I got you. I've been there. I've done it. It's hard. I get it. But if it becomes your priority in other areas of your life and you can't read your Bible because you're too busy with school, I, I, I call baloney. And here's why. Because you, you still have time to hang out with your friends. You still have time to hang out with your, with your boyfriend or your girlfriend. You still have time to be on Facebook. You still have time to be on Instagram. And you're, and you're wasting away your day watching your TV shows, watching Dancing with the Stars. Is that even popular? Is that even out anymore? Dancing with the Stars, people still dance? I got a 50-50 response. Anyway, so Dancing with the Stars, The Voice, American Idol, uh, wh whatever you call it, you got time to do that, but you don't got time for the word of God. So the, the question is, is you're justifying sin with, with, with education, but you don't have time for God because you're too busy in your day doing other things. I, I, I'm all for the education. But you can't justify. We don't justify being separated from God. You guys got to understand, the silver was not the sin in his life. It was the theft. It was, the, it, it was that he 
idolized the silver to where he made it into a carved image. Education, our jobs, finances, sports. It's not, a, it's not a sin in our life. It becomes a sin when it becomes our priority. It becomes a sin when it becomes our priority and we justify our sin by saying, this is so important that it needs to be set up on a pedestal above God. It's more important than my relationship with God. That's when it becomes an idol. It's not a sin or an idol until it starts uh, it's until it starts being set up above God. Let me go on. Let me go on to keep on reading. Verse seven. This is cool. This is crazy. And I love it. Verse seven. A young Levite from Bethlehem in Judah who had been living within the clan of Judah had left the town in search of some other place to stay. On his way, he came to Micah's house in the hill country of Ephraim. Micah asked him, where are you from? He said, I'm a Levite from Bethlehem uh, in Judea. He said, I am looking for a place to stay. Then Micah said to him, live with me and my father's and my father's, will live with me and my father and priest and I'll give you 10 shekels of silver a year. So he made his idol, right? Out of 200 shekels of silver, he's like, I'm gonna give you 10 shekels of silver a year. He's not paying him very much. Um, I'll give you 10 shekels of silver a year, clothes and food. So he's going to pay, fully, fully paid, fully paid. So the Levite agreed to live with him and the young man was with him like one of his sons. Then Micah installed the Levite and the young man became his priest and lived in his house. And Micah said, now I know that the Lord will be good to me since this Levite has come to, my, to, to become my priest. What do we do? What do we do? So first we set up our idol. First we set up our idol, right? And then what we do, is, it's, it's such a good strategy. I think it's a great strategy. We, what we do is we usually leave our own church and we go find somebody that's gonna preach in a way that justifies my idol. If I'm in love with money, I'm gonna go to a church where all they do is talk about being rich. They don't want to talk about the truth of God. They don't want to talk about, uh, all they want to ever talk about is blessing and love. There is no condemnation. There is no death. There is no hell. And if there is, it's never spoken of. Why? Because it's unpleasant to hear. It's so funny. I was talking with my brother today. You guys may know him. You may or may not know him, but he goes to this church as well. Anyway, I was speaking with my brother today and, and it was interesting. He was talking to me about this guy and I already forgot his name. He's like, yeah, this guy's been doing this uh, ministry on college campuses for 40 years. And what he does is he'll, they'll go and they'll preach like a really, really hard word, hard word to take in. They'll be like, listen, you girls come to this school, you girls starting to sleep around. Look, you guys are just whoring yourselves out. And everybody gets all upset and they're like, you're just a hate preacher, this and that. And, but my brother goes, the funniest thing is that people would just gather around this guy like, 50, like 50 people, like wherever he goes, he's always just swarmed and he'll stay at a campus for a week. And, and he says, they don't have like these mega crusades or anything, but he's, they, what, they, what they testify is that on a weekly basis, they see, you know, between 10 and 20 people saved, like on every campus. And so they like establish this little movement and then they leave. And so what's interesting to me is that the world, they, they look at people like that and they'll say, oh, well, those guys are just hate preachers. But the, the, the reality is, is that he's calling sin, sin. In, in, our, in our society today, in our world today, everybody dumbs everything down where homosexuality, oh, it's okay, we just need to accept them for who they are or, or, uh, or uh, sleeping around before marriage, oh, you know, everybody, uh, people make mistakes and it happens, yeah, yeah. No. But, but, but that's not the case. And God's saying, look, don't justify your sin, repent of your sin. It's like what Roxy was talking about. We don't sit here and because we've sinned, we say, well, okay, well, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna, God put me through that situation so that he could use me through it. God did not put you into sin. That's a lie. That's a lie from the devil. Some people actually believe, and I remember somebody once told me this, is that God allowed me to go through this situation so that then he could later use me, uh, use me uh, to, pre to preach to other people like that. Oh, heck no. I know God did not 
tempt me and lead me into a life of sin and partying for three years in order for me to turn around and be able to tell you guys. No, I could have died in my sin and I almost died many times in my sin. But, be, but here's what does happen is that if, and I say if you do come out of your sin, if you do come out of your idolization, God can use it for his glory. God can turn it around and use it for his glory, but he did not choose to put you in sin or else he wouldn't be God. God wants to save you. God wants you to be holy. It goes on to say the following in verse 18. Verse 18, and we're going to skip. Say skip. Say skip. <sighs> Skippity, dude, uh, I have not skipped in a long time. Once my wife asked me to skip, and I was like, we're not skipping. I think this was like on al I want to skip. I'm not skipping with you, woman. <laughs> I love you. Skipping the house. I don't know. We're not skipping. Um, I, you know, it's such an awkward looking thing to do. I would not do it even to entertain you. It is so awkward. And I'll do anything almost, but not no. Thank you, Lord, for freedom from temptation. Amen. Judges 18, and we're going to skip down to verse 24. Did you guys, did you guys imagine it? <laughs> Something like that. Judges 18, 24, if you're there, say, I'm there. He replied. So here's what happens. Here's what happens. Eventually, eventually, what happens is that your idol, whatever you built your foundation on, will come crashing down. The devil will not reward you for the sacrifices you have made in your life to establish your idol. I guarantee it. If you're making sacrifices in order to be rich, the devil will never reward you for that idol. The Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and everything else will be given to you. It's not seek these other things and then try to bring God on board, right? That's kind of what we talked about last week. So look, verse 24 says the following. It says, he replied, you took my gods uh, you took the gods I made and my priest and went away. What else do I have? How can you ask what's the matter with you? So this is Micah. And what's happened in his life is that the, Israel, is the, is that the Israelites have come into this town where his priest, the Levite, was living, right? And what they did is they're like, hey, that's a Levite. Let's not kill him, but let's take him back with us. He'll be our priest, like how he's supposed to be. And so... They're like, oh, look, and, and by this time, Micah had built for himself a lot of idols, not just the one idol that was 50 pounds. He made a lot of idols for himself, and they're like, oh, cool, let's take his idols, and let's take his priest. And so now Micah's chasing him down and saying, look, you've taken everything from me. I have nothing left. And then it goes on to say, the, 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 the Danites answered, don't argue with us or some hot-tempered man will come and attack you and you and your family will lose your lives. So the Danites went on their way and Micah, seeing that they were too strong for him, turned around and went back home. In other words, you will never win a battle against the devil. If it is you and the devil in a ring, you're knocked out. If it is you and the devil fighting about something, you will lose. It is only by the grace and by the power of God that the enemy falls. So you without God equals nothing. Listen, I'm going on. It's verse 27, it says, Then they took what Micah had made and his priest and went on to Laish against a peaceful and unsuspecting people. They attacked them with the sword and burned down their city. And burned down their city. So they take Micah, or I mean, they take, uh, they take the priest, they take Michael's idols. In other words, that person that you've uh, laid your respect into and you're like, oh, I just so respect this person and this preacher, whatever they say, and oh man, whatever he says is just right or whatever she says is right, and oh man, and, and, and you've laid your, uh, you've laid your uh, 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 trust in them and all of a sudden, they're gone. And you're out on the street and you've given everything into your idol and, and the enemy's taken it all. And then it says that, uh, that they went on against the town and that they burned it down. They were a good and peaceful and suspecting people. Some people say, well, I'm a good person and I'm going to get into heaven. 
Oh, I'm a, you know what? I'm a kind person. I do more bad than I do good. I'm a peaceful person. I'm going to get into heaven. And the reality is that good people don't get to heaven. That's not how it works. It's godly people get into heaven. You will not find good people in heaven. The Bible says only God is good. And those who think that they are good are actually just liars. Because God is good and it is God in you that allows you to even enter into heaven. It is the promise of the Holy Spirit on your life that allows you to get into heaven. So if we've built our foundation, if we've built on our, our foundation on the things of this world, if we build it on sports, if we build it on education, if we build it on family, some of us, we say, oh, family is the most important thing. It's not. Your family will fail you at times. Your friends will definitely fail you whenever it is more convenient for them. I mean, we, Lord knows, right? We've all got good friends, but there's been times where they burn us. Like, um, your best friend will rat you out. You're like, dude, what are you doing? Well, it was more convenient for them uh, to rat you out, right? Money, for sure, will fail you. Or a job, some of us, we put, so much of our attention into our job. And we're like, I'm gonna be the best of the best of the best at my job. And we don't approach it with God. We just build it. We build upon this idol ourselves. And we're saying, I'm gonna keep adding my time to it. I'm gonna keep adding my time. I was at an interview today. I'm telling you again. And the guy was like, so what do you do with your time? I'm like, oh, I'm a youth pastor. And, uh, and, and I work. And he's like, and I'm like, I'm not gonna work 80 hours for you. So I always, because in a sales position, they want your soul. If you guys, if any of you ever get into sales, Lord help you. They want your soul. They're like, will you sacrifice to me? And I'm like, no, God, no. I will. No, like, I'm like, look, I, I, the most I can ever give you is 60 hours if there's good commission. That's it. Because I'm only getting paid for 40. You guys know how work goes, right? So, if you're, if you're a salaried person, you get paid for 40, even if you work 80. So that's what I told him. I said, look, you guys want me to work 80 hours. Let's say I make a lot of money, but you know what? If you divide that by two, which is a regular work week, then I'm not making very much money, am I? He's just staring at me. I don't think he gets people that talk to him that way. The interview went well, I think, but uh, I, don't, he, I haven't heard. So I haven't heard back. Um, anyway. What I'm trying to get at is that if you make if you make it your if you make it your foundation if you make it your uh, your strength then it's gonna that that'll be what breaks you down. Some of you, you know, I'm all for beauty and I'm all for whatever. I'm all for it. Look, I got a beautiful wife. Dang, that girl's hot. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. I could just sing a song of praise here to God for giving me a wife. Look, somebody's got to look good in the, in the family, right? So anyway, so look, I'm all for beauty. But if you build your life upon that, and some of you are thinking, well, I'm going to, because I'm so good looking, I'm going to marry somebody that's going to provide for me. Or I'm, because I'm so smart, I'm going to marry somebody that's going to provide. Or because I'm so, I'm so gifted in sports, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something, and I'm going to build all my foundation on this thing. But the truth is, is that God will not be mocked. It is not a matter of how good you are. I want you to look around yourself. Look around at celebrities. Look around at rich people. Anybody that has built their foundation on the things of this earth, they are devastated. You're saying Oprah Winfrey's still alive? That woman is so confused. I've never met somebody. I've never, not met, I don't, I don't want to meet that woman. But I've never seen somebody so confused. I've heard her talk about religion before. And it's just like, boom. I'm like, man, that is not real. That is not real life. Oh, all these different religions that she comes up with. And that woman is devastated. That woman is broken, even though she's like the richest woman on earth, I think. She, she was number one some year. Oh, my wife is, she said. Anyway, you mouth it at me, I'm gonna say it out loud. Anyway, so, <laughs> it's because you got me, baby. Hey, so anyway, so, um, modesty runs in our family. <laughs> God help them. God help them see what you see, uh, what my wife sees. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm not. Anyway, so, whatever we build our foundation on, 
That thing will fail us at some point. Why? Because the devil is looking for a good opportunity to pull the carpet from under your feet. Here's the amazing thing. The enemy, he will let your success grow. That's the most amazing thing. And I see that in the lives of my friends is that they'll dedicate their lives to something and then they'll see success in it. But later on down the road, once they have affluence, once they have influence, once there's somebody, once they finally reach something good, that's when the devil drops you. Why? Because he wants to ruin you to the point where you can't get up. You guys see that? Your idol will destroy you. We can't come to God on our terms. We can't come to God on, with our own selfish ambitions. That will destroy us. We must come to God for God and allow him to do everything else in our life. That doesn't mean be lazy. The Bible says that the man who doesn't provide for his family is worse than an unbeliever. So you provide for your family. You go to work, right? You go to work. You get a job. You, 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 start, you start doing things, but you know what I always say? I always say, God is my boss. And when I go to work, I say, God, you're my boss. What you want me to do? Now, I mean, I know the rules at work and this and that, but God is my boss. God is, your, God is your authority figure, and you work as unto the Lord. You do everything as unto the Lord, and God will provide a way for you. But you can't, you can't give up. You can't give in to your idols. You can't give in to the thing that's easy for you to do. We all have that area. Good thing there's a clock, because I could probably keep on talking, right? We all have giftings. There's all, we all have things that we can do. You guys could keep on singing. And I'd enjoy it, the worship team. Let's stand up. The Bible says, lean not on your own understanding. Don't depend on yourself. You will fail yourself. And there won't be anybody to blame but you. If, if something goes wrong in my life, if, if I lose my job, you know what I say? I say, God, what's next? God, what's better? Why? Because I never gave myself this job. So if God takes something, I, I didn't lose my job or anything, but, anyway, but if God does take something away from me, I say, God, what, what do you have for me? I don't look back on myself and get, oh, I'm so bad and nobody likes me and I'm depressed. No. Because I did not build this, what God has given me. God gave it to me. It's God's. It belongs to God. I did not form my wife. God gave me a wife. And the Bible says that a good wife is a gift from the Lord. So all you out there who are trying to force yourself into marriage or trying to be all goofy and silly, trying to get married and trying to accommodate the other person and lose your own personality and lose your own character in order to accommodate somebody else. Some of you aren't even dating and I'm talking to you. You're trying to be something that you're not in order to get somebody that you really don't want, but because it's cool. Oh yeah. The Bible says that a spouse or a wife, that's a gift from God. Your relationships, if you, build them on, uh, if you build them on Christ, the Bible says that there's this foundation that's already been laid and that is Christ Jesus. Build everything on God. Build your future on God. Build your education on God. Build your skills on God. Build your ambitions on God. Because God knows what to do in your life in order to make you satisfied in order to make you successful in the best of your abilities. You don't know how, how many abilities you have until you surrender yourself to God and God's like, bam, you're my child. I'm gonna raise you up. The Bible says, humble yourself under God's mighty hand and he, he, he himself will lift you up. What can you do? What can you do on your own? You can only do what you can do. If you want the impossible, if you want the, the magnificent, then you gotta sell out to something. And the Bible says you'll either be a slave to this world or you'll be a slave to God, but you can't serve two masters. And you pick, 
and you can slave away at a life that you will get nothing in return for because when we go to heaven, none of this counts. Unless you're living in the Lord, everything counts. Let's pray. As we pray, I want you to consider your life. I want you to consider what you idolize or who you idolize. Some of you idolize preachers. Some of you are saying, oh, I want to be like this preacher, or I want to be like that preacher, or I want to be like Beyonce, or I want to be like this person or that person. And God is saying, drop your idols or else the devil will take them away at the least convenient time. Oh, you're going to lose them one way or another. You will lose one way or another. I promise you. I remember when I lost everything and it hurt. Everything. But, but that's okay because where I am today, it's much better. Once I surrendered my life to God. Once I surrendered my life to God. Until you surrender your life to God, you will lose. If not today, then tomorrow. If not tomorrow, then next year. If not next year, then three years from now. Your loss is coming. I promise you that. Unless you surrender to God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, my Jesus, for your word. God, I thank you for conviction. Lord, God, help us to surrender our idols, to surrender this arrogance that our idols, our, our, our idols are built on, to surrender our self-righteousness and our pride, to surrender this thought of, oh, he's just talking about somebody else. No, I'm talking about you. I promise you I'm talking about you. You need to find it and you need to surrender it to Jesus. Whatever's holding you back from God, you need to surrender that to Jesus or it'll be your destruction and this is your warning. This is your warning. God will not be mocked. God loves you. God cherishes you. You're his child. He cares for you, but God won't be mocked. We're young and we think that we're invincible, but God won't be mocked. God, I pray right now. Can we just join hands? Let's just join hands. I want you to pray for the people in your row. And I want you to pray for a strength. I want you to pray for a surrender. I believe that we all have something that we can surrender to God. I believe it and I know it.